Hey, Clemson family, it's Florida State Week for the Tigers as they head to Tallahassee with the Seminoles looking to rekindle the intensity of this ACC rivalry. Here we go. Let's preview the game. I'm Daniel Shirley. We'll lean on Roy Philpott and his expertise about the Seminoles to break down this game, see what Florida State can do in the game Saturday night against Clemson, and we'll talk about a decommit that came up for Clemson on Thursday morning. Those do happen, maybe more than ever. I'm Bill Zimmerman. Welcome to episode 32 of the Reign Supreme Allway podcast. You can find all our episodes at our homepage, www.clemsonkickoff.com. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Both of those are at Clemson Kickoff. And we really appreciate all of you who are checking us out on youtube.com slash Clemson Kickoff. Give us a quick subscribe. That'll keep you posted whenever we update twice each week. Let's go ahead and get real quick into that decommit before we preview the Florida State game because that FSU conversation will be a longer one. And it's offensive lineman Zechariah Owens out of McDonough, Georgia, who no longer intends to be a Clemson Tiger. Yeah, you hate when these happen, uh, but they're going to happen. And that's okay. It's his. He's got to make the best decision for him. You'd rather him do it now than wait until uh, December when we get into the signing period. So not a surprise that this was coming, I think. Maybe the coaches knew this was coming. It seemed like they had been looking around at offensive linemen more recently than you would expect with three offensive line commits in the class. But I'm sure the Clemson coaches will adjust. They still do have the two linemen from Texas, and I think that's a big boost to this class, Harris Sewell, uh, Any, and Reed. I, I would say that they're 1A and 1B in this class for offensive line before you move forward. But we'll see where Owens ends up. There's a lot of talk that he's going to end up at Florida State, that that's the spot for him going forward. But we'll see how that plays out. Maybe he changes his mind and recommits to Clemson. Probably not very likely, but it could happen. And then we'll see where the Tiger staff goes from here. You mentioned Florida State. They've kind of made waves lately with having some non-committable offers, guys trying to commit and then being told, eh, you know, we're, we're not ready to take you in yet. So you hope that if FSU is the destination – that this young man's future isn't in limbo and he's got things sealed up there. I'm glad you mentioned the contact with other offensive line recruits for 2023 of late. I had hoped that that meant that they were going to take four. I mean, I'm always in favor of taking an extra offensive lineman. Instead, it does seem now in hindsight like they were looking for candidates who can fill up this third spot that is now vacant. Hopefully, Thomas Austin and the Clemson Tigers coaching staff are working their ties to add to the class with those two strong commits out of Texas, Harris Sewell and Ian Reed. We'll see where they go to find that next commit, and hopefully we'll get a little insight into that in a future episode with guests that we have lined up there. Again, I don't think this class is falling apart or anything. I think you're just going to see players decommit. You know, again, you'd rather them do it now than wait later in the process when you don't have time to have another option. And it feels like the Tigers will have another option moving forward. But he, look, he's a good player. He's going to be a good player no matter where he ends up. But if he didn't feel comfortable being in Clemson's class, this is the best thing for him. And it's the best thing for them moving forward. Apparently, he was pretty open that this is about money. And look, I'm not going to hold that against a guy. It reminded me of a few years ago when the XFL was not going to require guys to be in college for three years. And someone asked Justin Ross about that. And he said, well, I could see where that would matter to some people. You know, if NIL is going to be greater one place than another, and that's what a player and his family are really pressing for, go for it. Good luck to you. Hope you're healthy. Hope you find what you're looking for. Dabo Sweeney and the Clemson Tigers still are committed to recruiting without NIL being the focus, with Paw Journey being the focus instead, with all the things that this program can do for a player over the long haul to really not focus so much on football income, but really a life income that will last for decades and decades and not the short period that a football career can provide. So again, very interesting to have FSU ties there with Owens and bit of a coincidence, or maybe not so much of a coincidence if the Tigers coaches knew this already. Maybe Florida State said, hey, let's try to make a splash during this game. Who knows? Maybe I'm overthinking it with that, but should be interesting. It does kind of segue us into the Florida State game this week. By the way, be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube at Clemson Kickoff or follow us on your favorite podcast app, and we can keep you posted all the time. We're joined now by ESPN announcer Roy Philpot taking time for us at Hartsfield Airport, which is never a fun place to be if you ask me. But Roy, I appreciate you taking time. I know you called the Florida State game against Louisville earlier this year, so we sure wanted your perspective on the Seminoles. 
Yeah, no, Bill, appreciate it. Daniel, good to be with you guys. Listen, Hartsfield Jackson is the world's most efficient airport. I, I have no problem at all hopping on a podcast from here. Good to be with you guys. Know Florida State well. Enjoyed uh, talking with Mike Norvell and getting to know his team a little bit way back where he had uh, that road trip on a Friday night to Louisville. Look, they're a team I think it's on the rise. They're, they're not back, but they're able to spring an upset against Clemson uh, Saturday night down at Doe Campbell. That's certainly a big step in that direction to be back. So I think obviously a lot's on the line in this one. Roy, what is it about this team, do you think, that is improving? What have, what have you seen from them since Mike has taken over as the head coach? I think the skill positions are, are there, you know, with what Johnny Wilson has done this year, the transfer from Arizona State. Uh, their offensive line, I think, has played significantly better. They've been more consistent. And then a, a quarterback uh, with Jordan Travis, I mean, he, he's a guy that, you know, can run around a little bit. He, he's got great athleticism, but he's accurate, and he can throw accurately on the run. So, I mean, it's just I, – I point to their offense – is just looking more like some of those old school Florida State teams. Now, are they all the way back? I, I don't think so, not just yet. But Mike Norvell's had to change a lot there in a short period of time. And I, I think they're making strides uh, in those directions. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what it looks like coming up Saturday night. But it's a, you know, it's a team that is a much better version of itself compared to two or three or four years ago in the end of the Jimbo Fisher era. I think really because those skill positions and, and primarily quarterback, they're starting to bring in some more explosive athletes that, that kind of feel like they know what they're doing and they kind of have a brand starting to build a little bit. We talk a lot about on our podcast here about offensive line, but once you have the quarterback in place, that really kind of speeds up the process, doesn't it? And it seems like they have that guy. Yeah, it does. I mean, if you've got a quarterback that is competent, you know, athletic, he's got a strong arm, all those those things that, that Jordan Travis has, you know, you're, you're going to have a better chance. It felt like for Florida State, you know, down in Tallahassee, going back to DeAndre Francois, like they just missed on a handful of guys at that position. And the offensive line wasn't playing great, wasn't consistent. You didn't really know what their identity is. Man, ironically, some of the same things that Texas A&M is dealing with right now. Another story for another day. But like all those things have kind of come back, um, I, I think, into the spotlight in a positive way for the Knowles. So, Travis is a huge part of that. You got to have a quarterback to win a championship. You got to have somebody that's got a little bit of experience or elite level talent. And again, I think Travis is is uh, right right there in, in those categories and has done a ton uh, of good things this year for Florida State, especially when he's been healthy. What have you seen out of their receivers? Because I know Davis Sweeney talked about them a lot this week. Yeah, Johnny Wilson's the one guy that stood out in our game. You know, he had I, I think seven eight catches, almost 150 yards, two touchdowns, and just he bailed Florida State out. Rodemaker came in at quarterback when Travis went out near the end of the second quarter due to an injury. Thought that was going to be a big issue long term for Florida State. It turned out not to be. He came back the next week and Rodemaker just started dropping dimes, uh, especially with the, the the deep ball to Wilson. So, you know, it's it, again, it's not work done. It's not Mark Vanover. It's it's not um, Snoop Menace and. Peter Warwick and those guys, but they, they look close to him. So, I mean, I think those receivers that they have, you know, led by Wilson, they've got some competent tight ends, too, that can beat you in the downfield passing game with Travis uh, throwing the football. Uh, it, it, it looks good, and I think, you know, that's one of the reasons this spread is as low as it is uh, coming into Saturday night. I think three and a half. Uh, Clemson was favored by three and a half last time I saw it. Uh, it's, that, look, it's because they, they can create plays in the downfield passing game. Offensive line is going to give Travis some time, and uh, – you know, it's it's one of the reasons I think this game will be pretty close. What do you think of their offensive line? You mentioned them there real quick. I, I don't think they're what they used to be, obviously, but it feels like no. they are getting better. Yeah, they are. They are. And, I, I, again, I, I go back to identity and, and brand. It, it felt like the last three to four recruiting cycles under Jimbo Fisher, the first one or two with, with Mike Norvell, he's trying to bring in guys, grow them up, added some guys in the transfer portal. I think that that's helped them out considerably. But all those cycles, maybe five or six in a row, they just missed on guys. And, and they brought in players that, that didn't pan out and maybe weren't highly rated as some of the guys that we saw when Florida State was winning a national championship in 2013. And the end of the Bobby Bowden era to a certain extent, and, and certainly when Jimbo had it going early on uh, in recruiting. So, I mean, they're more physical. Uh, they're, they're bigger. Uh, there, there's more... Um, you know, I don't want to say stoutness, but there's just more girth in the interior of the line where they, they didn't have that four years ago. And Clemson was able to exploit that, and uh, a lot of other teams were as well. On the other side, what do you – it always felt like Florida State had 
five or six guys up front that just could dominate. What do you, where do you think they are as far as getting back to that? Well, I want to see Jared Verse, you know, get in there, stay healthy. Uh, but, you know, they brought him in as a transfer from Albany. This is a guy that had uh, one scholarship offer coming out of high school and, and just really grew up on the fly uh, playing for Albany. He transfers in, and, and look, he, he was re- really responsible uh, for those block kicks against LSU way back in week one. And, you know, he went out with an injury in the game that we called against Louisville. But when he's on the field, he is a disruptor. And I think that's somebody that Clemson's got to be very aware of uh, coming up on, on Saturday night because uh, he's got, he's got NFL potential, um, you know, his ranginess, the length of his arms, and just his ability to, to get after the passer is, is something I don't think that they've had, you know, consistently in a long period of time. So I, I, I think about their defensive line versus a guy that, that stands out. They've had some other injuries up front, you know, with Lovett. They've still been, I, I think, okay there. So, you know, Mike Norvell, the job he's done recruiting, I think the job he's done at the transfer portal has paid dividends up front on the defense. Isn't it funny? Like, I thought, you know, a lot of people were overlooking Verse just because he played at Albany. If that, yeah. if you can play, you can play, and he's showing that. No, he is. He is. And, I mean, again, on special teams, he, he he's a pass rusher and, and a guy that, you know, you're not going to out physical. So what does that look like against, you know, Clemson's offensive line Saturday night? You know, Florida State's got to be coming in thinking, hey, we, we got a chance to win some one-on-one matchups there. And, uh, and, and Verse is a big reason why. I'm pretty sure that – uh, you know, Coach Sweeney and, and the offensive staff and Brandon Streeter have, have identified him, you know, in the film room this week. We got to make sure we know where this guy is at all periods, all, all points in time, and, uh, and and make sure we account for him in, in the proper way. What do you think about Clemson's offensive line against that defensive line? It feels like Clemson's offensive line's gotten better. They have. Um, I do, and I think, you know, Clemson's offensive identity is, has come into the spotlight these last couple of weeks where – all right, a little bit more for Will Shipley. Uh, you've got your other backs getting involved. And, and DJ Uyangale, for the most part, I think has is, is had an ample amount of time. Now, he was challenged a little bit uh, going to NC, you know, playing against NC State uh, in Death Valley and, and, and trying to handle his business there. You know, Boston College tried to do some things and got to him a little bit in that first half. But, you know, Clemson has, I think, held its own up front. That was a big question mark last year. People look at DJ Uyangale and they talk about his improvement, his consistency. Big part of that is, you know, Antonio Williams on the perimeter and God is starting to make some plays. His tight ends making a ton of plays and Brenning Stool and Davis. But the offensive line has, has kept him upright, whereas this time a year ago, uh, that was not the case. And I think he even heard from the, uh, the Clemson coaching staff this week that, uh, you know, they went back and watched the film from last year against Florida State and just, just couldn't believe what they saw. That's not the case this year. Offensive line and um, you know, even a freshman in Miller kind of getting some snaps at, at tackle uh, is, is a big reason why. People don't like talking about it. It's not sexy. Uh, I get it. I, I'm guilty of it as well as as an announcer, as a play-by-play person. But uh, you turn on the film and compare it to last year on the Clemson side of the equation, and it's night and day difference. Any other guys on defense that kind of stand out for you, for them, for Florida State? I mean, you know, they, they've been opportunistic uh, at, at times. Uh, you know, just off the top of my head, no. But I, I just think athletically, you know, they, they pass the eye test more than what they have at any point. I would say going back to 2015, you know, they won the national championship 2013. You think about Jameis Winston, Kelvin Benjamin, made the college football playoff the next year, got routed by Oregon in the semifinal. And then since then, it, it's just been a hodgepodge of, of not even mediocrity. You know, they, they've really struggled and just trying to get to a bowl game now uh, under Coach Norvell. So, I just look on that side and I, I think, okay, transfer portals worked out well for you. Recruiting has worked out well. You, you've got guys led by verse that, that can get after the passer a little bit. And it, it's just a, a couple of steps in that direction of kind of what we used to see from this group uh, going back to the, to the late 1990s and uh, even the early 2000s. And it feels like they've been a little bit unlucky the last couple of weeks, right? They're very easily could still be undefeated. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the Wake Forest game, people don't want to give Dave Clawson and, and Sam Hartman and, and that group the credit that they deserve. But, you know, Florida State, that game against the Deeks went right down the field, grabbed a 7 nothing lead, and it just felt like, okay, man, they, they, these guys have got it rolling, especially with the way that they stormed out of the gates against Boston College, open kickoff to return for a touchdown, 21 nothing before you can blink your eyes in the first half. And, and then Wake, with all of its veteran experience, 
and and all the great wide receivers and an opportunistic defense just seized control of that game and you know just reversed everything. They led it 21 to seven in the first half, and, and Florida State was ne never able to bounce back the way that they needed to. And, and listen, last week against NC State, that's just a situation where everybody's got to be better. And I, I know that that's eating at Knowles fans this week, where you're driving, you're down two, you got 30 seconds left, throwing it to the end zone. You got man coverage out there, and if just the ball is placed anywhere other than where it was, it's either incomplete or, uh, you know, maybe you get a touchdown on the back shoulder fade. It was intercepted, and that was a ball game. Yet that's part of the growing up process, I think, that that program's going through right now. But, yeah, you should have won it. You were in a great position to win it, and you just got to be smarter. I think that's one area where you look at the two programs right now, and, and you say, okay, well, Florida State still has some work to do in that department, and they do. A win against Clemson would be exactly what the doctor ordered, obviously, uh, for our friends in Tallahassee. So uh, they're, they're looking at that, I think, this week. Uh, you know, I think Coach Norvell and uh, Coach Atkins on the offensive side are, are, are looking at this team thinking, all right, we, we've got the ability to do this. Can we grow up in a different way than what we were not able to do at NC State or Carter-Finley uh, Stadium last week? So. I mean, look, they're, they're itching to take that next step. They're trying to find a way to do it. If they do, it's, it's, it's warp speed ahead, you know, this season for this team, but didn't do it last week. And I think that they showed that there's, they still got a little bit more work to do uh, to try to get over that proverbial hump. You know, Travis did pretty well on the ground. He showed that explosive potential that he has with a 71-yard gain at one point, finished with 108 yards. But last year against Clemson, he finished with negative yardage. And then you saw against Louisville that he was in the negative yardage before he was injured in the second quarter during that game. So how do you make sure you keep Travis bottled up and not let him run wild on you? I think it's significant Saturday night that Brian Bercy is back. That was one of the things I talked about you know, back in the preseason, the summer, if Clemson was going to be what it aims to be and get back to the college football playoff. I thought Bercy's health was of primary importance because, I mean, he, he's a run stuffer. He's a pass rusher. He can get through and get penetration through the A-gap. He's healthy this week. You ask me, how can you try to contain Jordan Travis? I think Bercy is, is a big factor and kind of what we've heard you know, from Clemson so far is that their defensive line is as healthy as, as maybe it's been in, in a couple of years. They're going to lean on that. Brzee, if he's a full go and, and mentally everything's there, and certainly he's been through a lot these last couple of weeks and months, really. Um, I, I think that's integral and just trying to contain Jordan Travis. And look, I, I think at his heart, Jordan Travis wants to throw it. I think he wants to extend plays to get the ball down the field with some of the playmakers he has. I don't know how, how much he wants to actually escape and you know, peel off 30-yard runs. He's capable of it. And I think Florida State should utilize him more in that capacity. But, you know, are we, are we going to see that against Clemson's defense? I, I you know, I kind of have my doubts about it. But, you know, to contain him, you, you need to be healthy. And uh, I, I think it sounds like that Clemson is as healthy as it's been, you know, up front in, in quite some period of time. So, yeah, that, that, that's a matchup. That's a chess match. If I'm Mike Norbell and Coach Atkins, the OC, I'm trying to get him on the perimeter, on the edge, give him some run pass options and, and let that athleticism take over because, Third down and seven, you're deep in your own uh, on your own side of the field, and and you know you don't have anybody open. Travis can extend drives for you that way. And, and look, Clemson secondary is going to be under the spotlight in a game like this too, with with Johnny Wilson and and some of those others. The other thing I would add is this: I think the health of Trayshawn Ward in this game is of critical importance too, from the Florida State side, because he gives you a different burst and gives you that home run ability. If he can't go, and I don't, I don't know if he can or if he can't. You know, Toa Philly, I, I think, has been solid, and, and Benson's been good. But Ward's the guy I want to see in there if I'm a fan of the Knowles. And then conversely, when Clemson's trying to run the ball, people have said that the Knowles are a little bit weak up the middle. That's also been a weakness for the Tigers trying to run the ball up the middle this year, though. So a little interesting matchup there to see if Clemson can get the ground game going. I don't know. I, I, I like Florida State's defense up the middle with Bethune coming in and, and getting the job done in one of those backer spots. I mean, he's been everywhere. You know, Clemson's going to have to get Uwe Angelale involved in the ground game. I, I still would like to see them do that more early in games because that'll open things up for Shipley and, and, and Mafa, I, I believe, later on. They're, they're still not doing that as much as I would like. And, look, Uwe Angelale isn't a fantastic runner. We all know that. But he's shifty, a little jump cut as he gets going. And, and, and you know, he can extend plays. So uh, I think they need to do some of that. But I, I like Florida State defensively uh, up the middle. I think they got playmakers at linebacker. I, I like the defensive line. 
It's not Clemson's, but it's good. And I think they're going to challenge Clemson in its interior of the offensive line Saturday night for sure. And that is going to be on your company's air Saturday night. It'll have Chris Fowler, Kirk Street, and Holly Rowe on ABC. But also that Pat McAfee show that's starting up is going to cover the Clemson broadcast. And that'll be on ESPN, too. So that's a fun thing that fans might be able to enjoy. Yeah, I think so. I, I like the fact that we're trying different things to see what piques the interest of, of certain viewers. And I think, uh, you know, this will be the second or third time that Pat McAfee has done that. And uh, he's high energy, man. It's hard to be around him and, and be sleepy. So I, I think if that's your thing, you know, tune on over. I think it's ESPN2 Saturday night for that game, the simulcast. And we'll see what that looks like. You know, certainly, I think he's been a welcome addition to game day. And he's done a great job since coming back to the company this year. It's been fun to watch. Safe travels to you. Really appreciate you taking time. Good luck out at uh, SMU for that game against Navy. All right. Appreciate it, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks very much. Roy Philpott from ESPN. Follow us on Twitter and on Instagram at Clemson Kickoff. We've got updates for you there as well. Well, Daniel, what else? So, Daniel, we covered a lot there. Again, thanks to Roy for joining us. What do you see as the key to this game against the Seminoles? I really believe it's got to be the defense keeping Jordan Travis wrapped up. I, I think that, look, he's a good player. They've got weapons. I don't believe they're going to be able to run the ball. I know Roy talked about that in Florida State trying to get a running game going. I don't see that happening. I really believe it's going to be all on Jordan Travis and those guys on the outside. So if you keep him in the pocket, keep him from getting on the outside and making plays, then I think Clemson's defense will control this game. You know, I don't know that Clemson's going to score 40 points, but I don't think it's going to have to. You know, again, the defense plays the way it's supposed to play, and it's healthy, and getting all these guys back, you know, you're probably looking at a 28 to 14 game, something like that. But I think you'll see the defense keep this game under control and give the offense enough time to get its footing and control the game. Maybe a lot like last week, right, with what we saw the game at Boston College. Yeah, I think Florida State is going to hit for some big plays or at least some chunk plays here and there. And then, yeah, on offense, actually, I feel pretty good about the offensive attack. It's going to be interesting to see if they can establish the run. Totally agree with what Roy said, that DJ Uyunglele is going to be one of the keys there to moving the ball on the ground and then mixing things up enough that the defense can't just key on Shipley and Mafa all night long whenever Clemson tries to run the ball. I really felt like the over was pretty secure on this game. Not that I'm much of a gambling guy. I just thought this would be a high-scoring game both ways. But with Vegas moving that spread down, it kind of gave me some pause. I still feel like Clemson really should win this game by two scores, but I just wonder what it is that I'm missing that the Sharps are seeing. So I think it's going to be a fairly dramatic game. And you know, the Florida State always gets up for this game. A lot of times it's closer than you think. I don't expect one of those blowout games like with the guy reading the book at the top of the stands a couple of years ago with his shirt off. But I do think that Clemson should be able to control this game. And if they get up and do the right things and play disciplined on defense, they should be able to control Jordan Travis, keep him contained. Just don't over pursue, right? Just don't fall into that trap of I'm going to be the guy who gets three sacks in this game of this mobile quarterback. Stay on assignment. Wes Goodwin hopefully will be selective on when he blitzes, when he keeps the team in base and gets a good feel for the game, much like he did against NC State. Those things can come together. You're starting to look at the rest of the schedule as sort of a downhill journey. Yeah, do your job, right? You don't have to do too much. There's nobody on this Clemson defense that has to do somebody else's job for this defense to be successful on, on Saturday. So as long as they stick to their assignments, do their job, don't try to do too much, don't try to be the hero. Bill, that's when we see these offenses take advantage of these defenses, when you have guys who are trying to do too much and they get out of their lanes, they're not doing what they're supposed to do in the secondary, maybe they're peeking into the backfield in the secondary, then you see these offenses take advantage. That's what we saw at Wake Forest when Clemson could not stop Wake Forest in the second half. We didn't see that at NC State. We didn't see that at Boston College. And I think I don't think we'll see that Saturday night because I really feel like this defense, as it gets healthy, is kind of finding itself a little bit. And I really believe you're going to see this defense play really well Saturday night. This really feels like the key to the season at this point, doesn't it? I know Syracuse is lurking next week. They come to Death Valley. Honestly, this should determine the Atlantic division. If Clemson can win this game, they really move into the driver's seat. Look, if you beat 
the three best teams in the division besides yourself, and that's what it feels like. I, I know Syracuse is undefeated. Syracuse hasn't played any of these other top teams in the division. Syracuse hasn't really played anybody if you look at the schedule. So it feels like there'll be several losses for Syracuse coming up. But if you beat NC State, Wake Forest, and Florida State, and feels like you will take control of the division, of the conference, and probably the playoff spot. I mean, that fourth playoff spot that everybody has talked about. And we'll see how Alabama and Ohio State and Georgia, how their seasons work out, Michigan maybe. But if you win this game Saturday, doesn't it feel like, Bill, like you've won the last really, really challenging game on your schedule? Maybe Notre Dame, as we see if they can figure out who they are. But this will be a big step forward for this team as it goes through the second half of the season. Finally, the pieces can start pulling together a little bit. Yep, definitely. Syracuse this week gets NC State, maybe without Devin Leary. So we still might not have a real barometer of who the Orangemen are when they come into Death Valley. So we'll see. If Leary can get in that game and certainly be effective, then we'll have a good litmus test of what Syracuse is. They are ranked 18th, so it could be another top 25 matchup for the Tigers. Definitely don't want to count them out because they always play Clemson tough. But right now, focus is on Florida State and can the Seminoles play the Tigers tough once again. Only one way to find out is to watch the game Saturday night, and I know I will be high energy for that one. Looking forward to it. Well, we are glad you found us, Clemson family. Go ahead and subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Check out our homepage, www.clemsonkickoff.com. We've got a lot of updates and a lot of places, a lot of good resources for you. Ways to connect with us in between Clemson games and in between our episodes. Keep checking back for more. Well, until our next episode, I'm Bill Zimmerman. I'm Daniel Shirley. Go Tigers.